Good evening and welcome to our program, Healing and Hope Through History, in celebration of Women's History in North Carolina. This event is hosted by the State Library of North Carolina's Government and Heritage Library. To learn more about the State Library of North Carolina and the services we offer, please check out our website. To view closed captioning, please use your mouse to hover over the control toolbar on the top or bottom of the screen and click on the closed caption button. Second, select either show subtitle or view full transcript options. To make any changes to the caption or accessibility settings, click on the closed caption button and select subtitle settings. A window will open. In the left pane, click on the accessibility and make any changes you would like. Tonight's program will be made available online via our YouTube channel, and you will receive a follow-up email with a list of resources mentioned tonight, as well as our presentation slides and transcript. If you have questions during the event, feel free to ask your question in the chat. If we are unable to answer it during the presentation, we will answer it during the Q&A session at the end. Additionally, we ask everyone to please keep their cameras off and sound on mute during the presentation. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a few minutes to complete our survey following tonight's program. We wanna hear what you have to say and we use participant feedback to inform future outreach events. Without further ado, please allow us to share a little about ourselves. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria Haas and I'm a digital projects librarian at the State Library's Government and Heritage Library. I'm a white person in my early thirties with brown eyes and brown hair and I'm wearing a green shirt. I began working at the State Library in 2018 as a digitization tech and have served in my current role since February 2021. Before coming to the State Library, I worked in museums, historical societies, and archives. As my past roles might indicate, I have a strong passion for history and preserving cultural resources while making them accessible for all to enjoy. Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Alyssa Putt, and I'm a digital projects librarian at the State Library of North Carolina's Government and Heritage Library, just like Victoria. I'm a white person in their early 30s, the short brown hair, teal brown glasses, and today I'm wearing a blue shirt and a gray jacket. I am a North Carolinian born and bred, and I've always been fascinated by our state's rich history and entranced by its terrain. I'm a graduate of NC State University and completed my master's in library and information science at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I joined the staff of the State Library's Government and Heritage Library last October. And before this, I was an educator in K through 12 English and social studies classrooms and school libraries. So it will come as no surprise that I'm particularly passionate about education, literacy, accessibility, and public history. Before we get started, let's take a minute to to discuss tonight's event. The title, Healing and Hope, comes from this year's National Women's History Month theme, Providing Healing, Promoting Hope. I think we can all agree that after the last few years, healing and hope are critical to our lives, and we are grateful to individuals who have shared their healing and hope in the past and present. We can only highlight a handful of stories in a single event, but we highly encourage you to do some deep dives of your own because there are so many extraordinary women who have made and continue to make contributions to North Carolina's history and progress as pillars of hope and healing. For our research, we relied heavily on three state library resources that you can use every day in your research. These resources are the North Carolina Digital Collections, Encypedia, and Anchor. The North Carolina Digital Collections is a free and full text searchable online resource that brings together content from the State Archives and the State Library of North Carolina. First made available in 2008, the Digital Collections contains over 90,000 and growing unique and valuable primary and secondary resources to support the research of North Carolina history and culture. A link to the Digital Collections is available in the chat. And here's your first fun fact of the night. Available for viewing in the Digital Collections is the first novel written by a state president and published in North Carolina, titled Matilda Berkeley for Family Anecdotes. Which was, which was published in 1804. The author of this book was in fact, a woman named Winifred Marshall Gales. A link to this novel is in the chat. Thank you. 
Instinkpedia is the online encyclopedia for the state of North Carolina and is maintained and managed by librarians like us at the State Library of North Carolina's Government and Heritage Library. With over 8,000 entries, Instinkpedia contains information about a wide variety of people, places, and topics that are relevant to North Carolina that you can use in your research or to impress your friends and family with your knowledge of the Old North State. A link to Instinkpedia is available in the chat. Within Instinkpedia is Anchor. Anchor, which is short for a North Carolina history online resource, is a freely available online history textbook with more than a thousand entries. While Anchor's target audience is students in grades eight through 12, learning is a lifelong pursuit and Anchor has information for learners and historians of any age. A link to Anchor is in the chat. One last thing before we begin our celebration of women who have shared their healing and hope with the state of North Carolina throughout history. During our presentation tonight, we will use the poll feature on Zoom to allow you to test your historical knowledge. This is totally optional and don't worry, we won't assign you any grades. If the Zoom poll feature is new to you, that's great. We're excited to learn together. When there is a question to be answered, the poll window will pop up in the middle of your screen and you can select the answer you think is best. You can respond once to each question and your answer is anonymous. We will not be keeping score, but you're welcome to keep your own at home. If you're joining us from a mobile phone or tablet-like device, the Zoom poll window may cover parts of the presentation when it appears on the screen. We will share our slides and other materials with you via email after our presentation, so there's no need to worry about missing anything. We are also going to share this information in the chat. Our first question using Zoom's poll feature. No matter what you choose as your answer, I guarantee it will be correct. Have you used Zoom polls before today? Please answer this question using the Zoom poll feature. Looks like we have a great mix. Some of us have used the poll feature before and uh, it's the first time for some of us. So hopefully everyone will learn something new by the end of this. Now we're going to move on to Victoria as she highlights the first woman that we are honoring as a beacon of hope and healing this evening. All right, which classification of nursing, which is still in use today, was Mary Lewis Weich responsible for establishing in North Carolina? Was it certified nursing assistant, licensed practical nurse, registered nurse, or doctor of medicine? If you answered registered nurse, then you are correct. Mary Lewis Weich was born in 1858 in Vance County, North Carolina. Mary developed into a caregiver and educator at an early age as a result of her mother passing away in 1871 and had five siblings to care for. But Mary didn't find her calling in medicine until she was well into her 30s, graduating from Philadelphia General Hospital in 1894 at age 36. After graduating, she returned to her home state to share what she learned with other young women of North Carolina. In October 1894, Mary was hired as head nurse at the newly established Rex General Hospital in Raleigh. Staffed primarily with volunteers, Mary immediately went to work and organized the Rex Hospital Training School for nurses and had four graduating students after two years. But with little formal nursing training available throughout the state, Mary recognized that if North Carolina were to become a leader in the field, there needed to be a state organization for nurses. And in 1901, Mary helped organize the Raleigh Nurses Association, which has evolved into the North Carolina Nurses Association, and served as its president for six years. After leaving Rex, Gen Rex General Hospital in 1897, Mary took up the position of charge nurse of the State Normal and Industrial College in Greensboro, now known as the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Between 1903 to 1913, she was the superintendent of nurses at Watts Hospital in Durham and later the superintendent of Sarah Elizabeth Hospital in Henderson. In addition, Mary led the movement to create free nursing course at UNCG, 
She also held several important offices, including the first chairman of the Legislative Committee of State Registration of Medicine and the position of Secretary Treasurer of the first Board of Examiners for Trained Nurses. Mary retired from the nursing field in 1925, returning to Vance County, North Carolina. There she wrote The History of Nursing in North Carolina, the first comprehensive account of nursing in the state. She died in August 1936, two years before the book was published. If you'd like to check out a copy of Mary's book, there's a link to our catalog record in the chat now. One of the crucial legacies Mary left behind was her efforts in the passage of the Act to Provide for the Registration of Trained Nurses, or better known as the Nursing Practice Act, in March 1903. This law raised nursing standards and required practicing nurses to register with the state. It also granted nurses the use of the title RN, or registered nurse, after their name, which guaranteed thorough training and incentive for all trained nurses to be recognized as the best in their calling. If you're interested in reading the act in full, a copy of the public laws and resolutions of the state of North Carolina, passed by the General Assembly at its session of 1903, is available in the North Carolina Digital Collections. A link to the state document is being shared in the chat. This important act was commemorated 100 years later when in 2003, the North Carolina General Assembly passed legislation to create first in nursing license plates. Still available for purchase, a portion of the license plate fees goes to the Mary Lewis Weich Fellowship Scholarship Award, awarded by the North Carolina Nurses Association. And staying on our theme of healers, in what year did the first woman earn a medical license in the state of North Carolina? Was it 1810, 1863, 1885, or 1904? Please answer this question using the Zoom poll feature. Here was 1885 when the first woman was issued a medical license in the state of North Carolina. That woman was Dr. Annie Lowry Alexander. Dr. Annie Lowry Alexander was born near Cornelius, North Carolina in 1864. Alexander was a daughter of Dr. John Brevard Alexander. After one of her father's female patients died after refusing a medical examination from a man, her father encouraged her to become a physician even though a female doctor was all but unheard of at the time, especially in the American South. Her mother, concerned with the cost of schooling and with the prospect of her daughter not marrying, was less supportive of the idea, but her father held that she must never marry or serve humanity, and Dr. Annie Alexander did just that. Alexander began her medical studies with her father, as well as alongside a tutor in her early teens before she enrolled at the Women's Medical College in Philadelphia at the age of 17. She then graduated from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in 1884 and worked as an assistant professor of anatomy at the Women's Medical College of Baltimore and as an intern at the Baltimore Children's Hospital. In 1885, Alexander earned her medical license from the Medical Board of Maryland Board of Medical Examiners. Out of 100 candidates for medical licensure in Maryland that year, Alexander earned the highest score on the exam. She was also the only woman. While recently licensed as a physician and working in Maryland, Alexander contracted tuberculosis and left the Mid-Atlantic to recover at her uncle's home in Florida. After a year of recovery, Alexander moved back to North Carolina where she completed the state medical licensing exam and began her practice in 1887. Dr. Annie Lowry Alexander was the first woman with a physician's license in North Carolina and the American South. Alexander had blazed a trail for future female physicians. Her commitment to healing was not perceived by all as an accomplishment. Some of Alexander's family members asked that her name not even be mentioned in their presence because they were so horrified at her status as a physician. And even though she was granted a license, it seems that there was no red carpet rolled out for Dr. Annie by the North Carolina State Board of Medical Examiners. We know from 100 years History of the North Carolina State Board of Medical Examiners, 1859 to 1959, which is in our digital collection, that while there seemed to be no opposition to her becoming a member of the Medical Society, the annual address at that meeting given by Dr. L. Julian Picot was on the subject, shall women practice medicine? Conclusion, after some impassioned or 
oratory was that God intended women for wives and mothers. Dr. Alexander remained true to her calling despite obstacles. She settled in Charlotte with her parents and traveled by horse and buggy to care for her patients. It took her an entire year to profit $2 from her medical practice, but slowly her reputation and practice grew. She was on staff at St. Peter's Hospital, now known as Carolina Medical Center, and at Presbyterian Hospital. At the start of World War I, Dr. Annie Alexander was appointed as a first lieutenant in the Army and was assistant surgeon at Charlotte's Camp Green. She served several terms as president of the Mecklenburg County Medical Society and as a vice president of the Women's Physicians of the Southern Medical Association. Dr. Alexander was known for her zeal for her travel and commitment to civic service. She was active in many organizations, including the Colonial Dames, Daughters of the American Revolution, and Daughters of the Confederacy. An active member of the Presbyterian Church, Alexander taught Sunday school in addition to all of her other involvements. Dr. Alexander remained true to her promise to her father, and she never married, but she did have an adoptive son, Robert Alexander. Dr. Annie Alexander was known to stay with patients who were ill, so it was not out of the ordinary when she stayed with a patient who had pneumonia in early October of 1929. Dr. Annie contracted pneumonia while caring for this patient and her lungs already weakened by tuberculosis later in life. She died at the age of 65 on October 15, 1929, leaving behind a legacy much larger than being the first licensed female doctor in the South. You can read more about Dr. Annie Alexander on NCpedia linked in the chat and on the resource sheet that will be shared with you after the presentation. The next one we are celebrating this evening was the first dean at the first state-supported school of nursing. Which university housed the first state-supported school of nursing in North Carolina? Was it UNC Greensboro, NC a and University, UNC Chapel Hill, or UNC Pembroke? Please answer this question using the Zoom poll feature. If you answered UNC Chapel Hill, you are correct. UNC Chapel Hill housed the first state sports school of nursing and the first dean of the school of nursing was none other than Elizabeth L. Kimmel. Born in Ohio in December, 1906, Elizabeth was the youngest of Charles and Maud Kimmel's five children. Before coming to North Carolina, Elizabeth was a long-standing member of the nurse, nursing service and promoter of education throughout Midwest and Eastern hospitals. She was a graduate of the College of Nursing and Health of the University of Cincinnati. She earned her BS in nursing education at NYU. Additionally, Elizabeth held a master's in educational psychology and a doctor's degree in education from Columbia, Columbia University's Teachers College. As you might imagine, having both a master's and a doctor's degree was a rare accomplishment for women of her time. Additionally, she held national standing as director of the Department of Measurement and Guidance of the National League of Nursing Education. In this role, she helped develop tests for nursing professionals. Such tests included criteria for applicant selection, assessments that measured students' achievements during various phases of their training, and, and exams for state licensure. And because she hadn't contributed enough to the field, she also published many articles on how nurses could improve upon their attention to patients. So when candidates for the position of Dean at the newly established nursing school at UNC Chapel Hill came under consideration, no one stood out more to the hiring committee than Elizabeth Luanna Campbell. Her achievements in the field made her the perfect candidate for the job, considering the early hurdles the School of Nursing overcame in its first decade. These challenges included limited funding, inadequate facilities for educating nurses, and a lack of student applicants, three significant factors for a school to succeed. But under Dean Campbell's leadership, the school succeeded. The state's first bachelor's program in nursing was established in 1951, and the master's degree program in nursing in 1955. Under Dean Campbell's tutelage, students developed to their fullest potential as people, citizens, and professional healthcare workers. Many of Elizabeth Campbell's students went on to serve in the medical profession in the state of North Carolina, including Audrey Booth, the first student to receive an MS in nursing administration in North Carolina, and the only student in the first graduating class. To ensure Audrey would get the most out of the program, 
Dean Kimmel often invited members of the nursing school's faculty and administration to their seminars. Elizabeth Campbell held the position of Dean until 1967 for a total of 17 years. Retiring in 1968, she spent her remaining years on a 68 acre farm outside of Chapel Hill until she died in 1981. If you'd like to learn more about the UNC Chapel Hill School of Nursing and its history, I highly recommend checking out the spring 2000 issue of the Carolina Nursing Magazine, available in the North Carolina Digital Collections. This issue highlights the first 50 years of the School of Nursing and discusses those early challenges in even greater detail. A link to this issue is being shared in the chat. The next subject's legal scholarship led to the inclusion of sex in the Equal Protection Clause, which has provided legal protection for women against um, employment discrimination. The Equal Protection Clause is part of which amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Is it the Fifth Amendment, the Thirteenth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, or the Nineteenth Amendment? Please answer the question using the Zoom poll feature. I think a lot of us remembered that that 19th Amendment was all about suffrage. We know it was about women's rights. The Equal Protection Clause is actually part of the U.S. Constitution's 14th Amendment. The Equal Protection Clause declares, nor shall any state deny any person the equal protection of the laws. And it now prohibits discrimination under the law based on sex due in large part to the work of Polly Murray. Murray was born in Baltimore, Maryland on November 10, 1910. Murray was one of six children born to parents Agnes Fitzgerald Murray, a nurse, and William H. Murray, an educator. Murray's rich multiracial lineage had a great impact on her understanding of the world around her and on her life's work, so it would be really remiss to exclude elements of Murray's family history that include sexual violence. If you would prefer not to hear these details, please mute your device for the next 40 seconds and then rejoin us. When Murray was three years old, her mother Agnes died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Her father, William, was experiencing mental illness, likely related to typhoid fever, and was unable to care for their six children after his wife's passing. For this reason, Murray moved to Durham at the age of three to live with her maternal grandparents, Robert and Cornelia Fitzgerald. Her grandfather, Robert, was a third generation educator who had been active in the anti-slavery movements in Pennsylvania and served as a union soldier. Murray's grandmother, Cornelia Fitzgerald, was a seamstress and homemaker. Cornelia was born enslaved. She was the daughter of Harriet, an enslaved woman, and the white man who raped her, who was the son of her wealthy enslaver. Both of Murray's aunts, Sarah Fitzgerald and Pauline Fitzgerald Dane, after who Polly Murray was named, were both educators. Murray's family was expansive, close-knit, and diverse in every sense of the word. She wrote that when all the members of her family got together, it was like a United Nations in miniature. Murray learned to read by reading the Durham paper aloud to her grandfather in the family's living room. When Murray encountered an unfamiliar word, she would spell the word out to her grandfather and he would give her the pronunciation. Growing alongside her insatiable hunger for knowledge and reading was her sense of justice. At age five, already an avid reader, she staged a protest when she was given only one pa pancake and her grandfather was given three at the family's kitchen table. Murray's education outside of the family's home took place in Durham's West End School and then at Hillside High School. After graduating from Hillside, Murray moved to New York to complete courses in hopes of attending a college, as the all-Black high schools in North Carolina did not have all the prerequisites required for many universities. She accomplished this task, and then she completed her bachelor's degree at Hunter College in 1933 and emerged into the job market at possibly the worst moment in American history. She worked with the Works Progress Administration, for the Urban League's Opportunity Magazine and in other jobs to attempt to make ends meet. In 1938, Murray applied to UNC Chapel Hill's Sociology PhD program and was denied admission citing her race. Across the country, cases were being launched and sometimes won against public universities who refused to admit black students. Murray found her situation particularly unjust because several of her white relatives had close ties to the university. Some were early attendees of UNC, another served as a member of the Board of Trustees, and another was a major benefactor to the university with a permanent scholarship in their name. Murray's rejection based on race made national news, leading her family to fear for their safety and lives. 
but a legal case was not pursued by the NAACP. While the NAACP's official reason for not pursuing a case against UNC was stated to be because Murray was living out of state at the time that she applied, researchers in Murray have asserted that it was actually Murray's gender identity and more masculine presentation that presented her from being seen as the perfect poster person for what would have been such a monumental case. Years later, in 1940, Murray was riding a bus home to Durham with a friend when conflict arose between the friends and the driver of the Greyhound bus. Murray was arrested and jailed, but her interest in pursuing a career in law was solidified. In the Durham, oh, in the Carolina Times article about the incident, Murray is referred to as a honey-tongued legal mind. You can read the Carolina Times article about the incident on Digital NC at the link that is in the chat. Murray was the only person perceived as a woman in her class at Howard Law School. It was during her time at Howard that she experienced extreme prejudice based off of not her race, with which she was already very familiar as we've just discussed, but instead because of her sex. She coined the term Jane Crow, which is a precursor to the concept of intersectionality. She actually excelled at, her, at Howard and graduated first in her class in 1944. Murray then applied to Harvard Law in 1950, but was denied this time because she was not of the sex entitled to be admitted. Nonetheless, Murray's legal scholarship was revered. Her work was used by lawyers in the 1954 landmark Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education, which struck down the separate but equal principle of segregation in schools. Polly's 1950 book, States Laws on Race and Color, was referred to as the Bible of the Civil Rights Movement by then NAACP leader and future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Murray's legal scholarship was also critical in the expansion of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protections Clause to include sex, expanding the understanding of, of the term person in the clause to include women. Future Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg listed Polly Murray and Dorothy Kenyon as co-authors on her 1971 brief for uh, Reed versus Reed to honor their work on which Ginsburg had relied heavily in making her case, including Murray's 1956 article, Jane Crow and the Law, Sex Discrimination in Title VII. In reality, by the time Gin Ginsburg's brief was written, Murray had shifted sales to writing, professorship, and civic action, and was soon to refocus on a future in faith rather than law. Murray earned her Master of Divinity in 1976 from the General Theological Seminary and was ordained a deacon that same year. Less than a year later, in January of 1977, Polly Murray was ordained as an Episcopal priest, becoming the first African-American female priest of the church. In July of 2012, the Episcopal Church sainted Polly Murray. Her feast day is on July 1st. Polly Murray died of cancer in Pittsburgh in 1985, and her autobiography, Song in a Weary Throat, An American Pilgrimage, was published posthumously and has recently been republished. What I shared tonight barely scratches the surface of Polly Murray's story, um, and her legacy of hope. To learn more, check out the resource page that will be shared with you after today's presentation or the links to the NCpedia and Anchor resources that have been shared in the chat. I wrote that she was really a submerged writer, but the exigencies of the period drove her into social action. So included on the resource sheet are many of her writings and information about where you can find them locally. The next woman we are honored to celebrate was one of the first women to be commissioned an army officer when she joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which was the women's branch of the army that spanned from its creation until it was integrated with the men's units in 1978. In what year was the WAC founded? Was it founded in 1916, in 1942, 1951, or 1965? Please answer this question using the Zoom poll feature. have some historians in the room. The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was created in 1942 and Debbie Johnson Roundtree was one of its first officers. Debbie Mae Johnson was born on April 17, 1914 in Charlotte, North Carolina to James Elliott Johnson and Layla Bryan Johnson. She was the second of four daughters born to her parents. In 1919, when Debbie was four years old, her father died during the 1918 influenza pandemic and the girls moved in with their mother to the home of their maternal grandparents. Her grandfather, Reverend Clyde L. Graham, 
ministered at East Stonewall Church, an African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church that's still standing in Charlotte, and ran a grocery store. Her grandmother, Rachel Bryant Graham, was a very active community member, seamstress, and homemaker. It was Rachel's work with the Colored Women's Club movement at East Stonewall Church that she connected with Mary McLeod Bethune, an educator, civil and women's rights leader, and pres presidential advisor and more, who would be a guiding force and mentor for Roundtree throughout her life. Roundtree was a writer and an orator from an early age. As a child, she kept her papers in cigar boxes that her grandfather would bring home from his store in Charlotte's Brooklyn neighborhood, which is now uh, known as the second, it's part of what's known as the second ward. She delivered her first speech in her grandfather's church at the age of three. While she has said that she could not remember the content of this first speech, she does remember, or she did remember that it was well received by the congregation. Inspired by one of her teachers to attend college in Atlanta, Debbie Johnson Roundtree enrolled at Spelman College in 1934. About her time at college, Roundtree would recount that Spelman was a finishing school and she had about as much business as she had in the White House because she didn't need to be at a finishing school, she needed to be at a working school. And work at Spelman, she did. After graduating in 1938, she taught in South Carolina before relocating to Washington, D.C. to assist in the war effort. When Roundtree arrived in Washington to meet with her lifelong mentor, Mary McLeod Bethune, about joining the war effort, she had no money to stay in a hotel and instead stayed at the YWCA. When it came time to meet with Bethune, Roundtree learned that she and others had bigger plans than simply a women's branch of the military. The WAC would be the first integrated branch of the military. Because Roundtree had already earned her college degree, the civil rights leader and family friend Bethune recruited her to be one of the 40 black women chosen to train as officers in the nascent Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Her picture together. Following military service, Roundtree began her studies at Howard Law School. When asked what her experience at the school was like, she responded, it was as though, as tough as could be. They didn't want women there, and there were five of them just out of military service, and they didn't want them. Uh, the women took men's places, and she said that if they didn't let her in, she was going to close it down, and she told them that. She was going to make a trial. She was going to go to the Supreme Court carrying her papers. There are her papers again. Clearly, it's a lifelong trend. Fortunately, Roundtree excelled at Howard, and taking her papers to the Supreme Court on her own behalf was not necessary. She graduated from Howard in 1950. In 1955, Roundtree and her law partner, Julius Winfield Robertson, took the case of fellow North Carolinian and Black WAC member Sarah Louise Keyes. Keyes was a WAC private traveling home on leave. When the bus stopped and changed drivers in North Carolina, the boarding driver woke Keyes, who was in her seat sleeping, and demanded that she give up her seat for a white Marine. Keyes said that she would prefer to remain in her seat and the police were called. She was arrested, charged with disorderly conduct, and fined what would be the equivalent of approximately $261 today. This case was of particular interest to Roundtree because she had a similar experience herself. In 1943, while serving as an officer in the WAC, she had been kicked off of a bus in Miami while traveling in uniform to recruit for the WAC. Carolina Coach Company was a landmark case for desegregation. Roundtree, Robertson, and thus Keyes won their case before the Interstate Commerce Commission, invalidating the separate but equal doctrine that had been in place for nearly 60 years since the Plessy versus Ferguson decision and setting the precedent that the Interstate Commerce Act's language banned segregation for interstate travel on the premise that there was undue and unreasonable prejudice and disadvantage. The case was won six days before Rosa Parks' defiance of Alabama's Jim Crow busing regulations and was later referenced by Robert F. Kennedy, who was Attorney General at the time during the Freedom Riders movements in the Freedom Riders movement in the 1960s. More about this case on NCpedia and the two links that are in the chat and on the resource guide that will be shared after our presentation. Although Keys versus Carolina Coach Company is Roundtree's most noted case, it is important to note that this was the only this was only the beginning of a truly incredible legal career. In 1962, Johnson was the first Black woman to be admitted to the Women's Bar of the District of Columbia. For many years, she served as a special consultant for the AME Church and as general counsel to the National Council of Negro Women. She was honored in 2000 with the American Bar Association's Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award. 
A scholarship at Spelman College was created in Roundtree's name in 2011. The same year, she was recognized with the Torchbearer Award from the DC Women's Bar Association. In addition to her work as a lawyer, Faith remained central to her Roundtree throughout her life. She was one of the first women to be ordained as a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church when she was ordained in 1961. The church had only begun recognizing women as anything higher than preachers in 1960. Debbie Johnson Roundtree practiced law and mentored lawyers until she retired in 1996 at the age of 82. She died in May of 2018 in Charlotte, her hometown, at the age of 104. To learn more about her or any of the individuals we're discussing tonight as healers and hope bringers, check out the resource guide that will be shared with you following the presentation. The next woman with a legacy of healing and hope was an American Red Cross volunteer. In what year was the American Red Cross founded? Was it 1860? 1881, 1900, or 1918? Please answer this question using the Zoom poll feature. If you answered 1881, then you are correct. I think you're right, Alyssa. I think we've got some historians in the room. <laughs> Emily Harris Prayer was born in Reedsville, North Carolina in October 1919, William and Jane Harris. She graduated from UNC Greensboro in 1939 with a BA in English, and while there served as president of the Student Government Association. And in 1943, she earned a master's in English from the University of Virginia. Like Debbie Johnson Roundtree, Emily answered the call to service during World War II. She didn't ask her family's opinion, just told them she was going and that was that. Eager to help, Emily chose to join the American Red Cross over the Navy waves for Army WAC women's auxiliary units because of the shorter training time. Reporting to DC, she and other Red Cross volunteers earned basic medical care, such as dressing minor wounds and changing bandages. Once in a 1999 interview, Emily joked that if you survived the three week trip from DC to California, to Hawaii, and finally to Western Australia, where she was stationed, then you survived basic training. Altogether, there were seven women in Emily's Red Cross unit. Morning, noon, and night, there were always two that would be permanently stationed in the hospital. In addition to completing tasks asked of them by the nursing staff, they contacted families and wrote letters for hospitalized soldiers. Wherever there was somebody who had some request or in need of some comfort, they took care of it so that the soldier could focus on getting better. A humble person, Emily never felt she contributed much to the war effort, but that it made her grateful and realized just how lucky she was. Because of her Red Cross experiences in World War II, she didn't take things for granted, nor did her time in public service end. Following the war, Emily taught at high schools in Greensboro and Charlotte. In 1946, she married Richard Prayer, philanthropist and future North Carolina congressman, pictured together on this slide. In 1958, she was chosen as Greensboro's Woman of the Year for her public service in community. During the 1960s, she was a strong voice throughout her husband's campaigns for office, was state chairman for National Library Week, and a member of the Governor's Commission on Education Beyond High School. In 1977, UNCG bestowed upon her an honorary doctorate of law and later the university's Centennial Award in 1992. In 1998, she was nominated for the North Carolina Award in Public Service for commitments to various historical sites, museums, and the North Carolina Symphony, and received the Nature Conservancy Chairman Award for her commitment to saving North Carolina's endangered land. Emily never forgot her early years in public service, as she continued to work with the Greensboro chapter of the American Red Cross throughout her life. Emily died in December 1999. In 2000, an 18,648-acre site in Terrell County was renamed the Emily and Richardson Prayer Buckridge Coastal Reserve to honor the prayer's work across the state. This land was set aside to help protect the white cedar forest and wildlife that calls it home. If you'd like to learn more about Emily Harris, 
you can, uh, there's a link in the chat about from the Emily Harris Perry collection at UNCG. The next woman we'll be honoring tonight has been instrumental in the development of the mRNA 1273 COVID vaccine. How long after the viral sequence release did the trial for this vaccine begin? Was it three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks, or 12 weeks? Make your guess or choose your answer uh, using the Zoom. The mRNA 1273 vaccine trials began just six weeks after the viral sequence was released for research. Uh, this quick turnaround was in part because of the existing and ongoing work of NIH scientists like North Carolinian Dr. Kismikia S. Corbett. As history is not just that which has occurred in the past, but is actually being made every day, we have chosen Dr. Kismikia Shanta Corbett, the scientific lead for the coronavirus vaccine team at the National Institute of Health's Vaccine Research Center as our last woman to honor as a leader of healing and hope this evening. Corbett was born in Hurdle Mills, North Carolina in 1986 and grew up in nearby Hillsboro. Always a highly curious kid, her parents thought that she actually may become a police detective, but Corbett's sight was set on a career in science from an early age. During her time as a student at Orange High School in Hillsboro, she was a part of the Project SEED program, which enabled her to gain experience in university research laboratories, including UNC's Keenan Labs, during her summer breaks. Participation in Project SEED solidified her interest in a career as a scientist, and she began considering pursuing her doctorate in a scientific field. After graduating from Orange High School in 2004, Corbett began her studies at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, as a biological scientist and sociology double major and a Meyerhoff scholar. It was at UMBC where Corbett's research of respiratory viruses began. While a student at UMBC, Corbett studied the respiratory syncytial virus. For those of us outside of the medical profession, RSV is a virus to which most humans are repeatedly exposed without much fanfare because many people's immune systems combat the virus. RSV is the most common respiratory illness leading to the, rest, to the hospitalization of infants and is a contagious virus that can impact all age groups, but tends to be the most severe in infants and elder people. As an undergraduate student, Corbett's curiosity led her to investigate why vaccines have been unable to protect against RSV through the NIH's undergraduate scholarship program from 2006 to 2009. Corbett graduated from UMBC in 2008 and worked as a biological sciences trainer at the NIH where she continued to start study RSV until she returned to North Carolina to pursue her PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. At UNC, soon to be Dr. Corbett researched another vaccine resistant virus, dengue fever. Dengue fever is the most common mosquito borne virus by measures of impact on financial and health metrics and currently has no antiviral treatment or vaccine. Dengue fever is unique in that repeated exposure to the virus can actually intensify the severity of illnesses in individuals. So traditional vaccine types, such as the inactivated virus vaccine that we're familiar with for the flu or the live attenuated virus vaccines that we may be familiar with for chickenpox are ineffective. Corbett explored variants of the virus in children and found that children with antibodies to a, only a single strain were more likely to become ill when again exposed to dengue fever than their peers who had antibodies from more than one strain. Her dissertation, Dissecting Human Antibody Responses to Dengue Virus Infection, gained her great recognition, including a doctoral merit award and an induction into UNC's Frank Porter Graham Honor Society. After completing her PhD at UNC Chapel Hill in 2014, she was appointed to the NIH as a viral immunologist. Her work at the NIH has been centered around vaccine platforms for influenza and coronaviruses, including mers cov and SARS for nearly a decade. In this photo taken last February, Dr. Corbett speaks, well, it's, it's 2022. This was February of 2021. So in this photo taken in February of 2021, Dr. Corbett speaks to President Joe Biden about research that contributed to the development of the Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines. 
At only 36 years old, Dr. Corbett is already incredibly distinguished in her field. Last year, she received the North Carolina Award, the Benjamin Franklin Next Gen Award, the Green Sands Prize, was recognized as an innovator by Time Magazine in the Time 100 Next list, and was named the 2021 Federal Employee of the Year. This year, she has already been awarded the Early Career Award for Public Engagement with Science from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Corbett is currently an assistant professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Outside of her professional work, she is passionate about STEM education and spends much of her time volunteering and mentoring students in underserved communities. To learn more about Dr. Kismikia Corbett or any of the other individuals we've highlighted this evening as healers and hope bringers, check out the resource guide that you'll receive following tonight's presentation and our, that we are sharing in the chat now. Thank you for attending our presentation, Healing and Hope Through History, in celebration of women's history in North Carolina. We would appreciate you taking the time to fill out our event survey and give us feedback on this program. The survey link is on this slide and in the chat box, and we will begin Q&A momentarily. As we, as we begin the Q&A section of our program, we encourage you to please post any questions you have in the chat box. Let's see. Let's see, our first question to, from the audience is, I see a question about you? the documentary, I Am Polly Murray. Um, a link to information about that film is in our resource guide. Um, it is streaming on a platform whose name I will not say right now because I do not promote particular streaming platform. It is accessible if you use that particular streaming platform. Let's see, we have a question here. Of, do you have any NCpedia entries about women's history? Unless maybe you might be able to take this one. We have many um, entries on NCpedia about women's history. Uh, we have several ways to access that. The best way that I would say to access that would be from our resource guide but I will also drop the links into the chat for three ways that you can access more information in, in North Carolina history on NCPedia. Just looking through and seeing, making sure we didn't miss any questions. I think a lot of um, questions we tend to get is, does the State Library have books? And um, I think that's a good question. A lot of people might not realize we do have books that you can check out. Um, I think there was a a link to the to our um, to getting a library card um, earlier in the presentation. Um, yes, we have we have books you can check out. Um, we have a lot of state publications. We have a huge genealogy collection um, that you can come in, utilize our resources, or check out um, check out books that we have. Um, we are a repository of state publications, so we have lots of state publications. Um, and we also have uh, digitized publications and more digital um, state publications available in our North Carolina digital collections that you can access from anywhere. Um, and you do not need a library card for that. But 
I always plug a library card. Those are those are my friend. I do love having a library card and having access to so many different resources. We just had a question in the chat about is the state library government and heritage library open to the public again? We are open to the public again. And I will drop the link to um, the GHL website in the chat so you can check the hours for each day. If there are no more questions, thank you for attending our presentation, um, Healing and Hope Through History and Celebration of Women's History in North Carolina. As we end our presentation, please join us in a virtual round of applause for our chat and tech support this evening, Michelle Underhill and Jen Hampt. Please fill out our event survey and share your feedback about tonight's program. The survey link is being shared again in the chat. And thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at future GHL events.